A warm good afternoon to one and all present here. Yeah. Fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, can all see you. Thank yeah. You. So welcome to this roundtable session on the topic simplifying retention for retail and CPS industry. So the platform is all yours to have one-on-one -on -one interaction to bring more voice to the table and play off with your ideas. So here I'd like to invite our moderator, Mr. Ankur Gatani, and our eminent speaker, Dr. Vivek Ji Mendoza. Mahua Chaturvedi, and P. Singh, Natasha Tuli. Yeah, okay, all right. Raj Gopal Nayak from Metro Brands Limited, Sandeep Mistry uh, from Pantaloons, Sandi, Sanjay Kumar Tripathi from Best Seller India, Shailash Jain from Miro, Shishir Gupta from KalkiFashion.com. Okay. okay, yeah, so doc, uh, Dr. Vivek Ji Mendonsa from Links Lawrence and Mayo, uh, Mahua Chaturbedi from Bagot, and Pissing from Sensonite South Asia Private Limited. So welcome to you once again. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much everyone for coming together. It's great to be here in a mixed audience of founders, brand owners, and product people, as well as tech folks, which is like, okay, I'm, I'm an important seat in the table now across pretty much all conversations, right? So I think I heard from him about uh, the way IT was now uh, doing him about how tech, uh, IT was leaning into tech and it's become like a function which is pretty much at the center of a lot of topics, handshake points with pretty much every department now. So I come from a company called WebEngage. We are in the space of user engagement and retention. Marketing, marketing technology, if that is a, a term which is, I'm sure most of you are familiar with. So uh, we work with companies to help them consolidate their data, help it, help bring it to a single point, uh, use multiple channels of communication to engage with their customers, and eventually improve engagement and retention. It's a simple uh, goal in that sense. But what we, I mean, and we work with 800 odd brands and all of that is in place. But what we tend to, get, you know, very intrigued about, and I'm a marketer myself, so I've been a customer to WebEngage on the other side. I do, I used to lead global CI for company called Foodpanda and 45 country operations, so really figuring out how to automate engagement at scale. Because food is a very personal topic, it's also a very hyper-local topic. I can't sell uh, a, you know, a Domino's Delhi whatever uh, offer to a guy in Bombay. It has to be within the same locality. Right? So that's where uh, we did a lot of work on automation at scale, and we could very clearly see the difference in terms of how uh, the customer response changes very substantially when you do a good job on personalization. So that's, that's was one journey. And then now we observe brands across different uh, spaces which are trying to do a lot of work on customer acquisition on digital channels. Lots of money going to Googles and Facebooks. And then uh, not necessarily all of them doing a equally effective job at retention. And retention essentially for me is when you've acquired a customer, he should be coming back to you to make more transactions. Uh, most brands in retail have either a direct retail footprint or some amount of digital footprint now, varying percentages of revenue coming from the digital first world. So most of you are spending money on Google and Facebook. And that's what I'm trying to now zoom in that, okay, if that's a space that you are going to be uh, putting a lot of energy and bandwidth on, you will want to solve for retention as well. In terms of when people have come on board, how do you bring them back? How do you sell more things to them? How do you get them across multiple categories, increase order values? And the part that I'm now awfully confused about in terms of how the retail ecosystem specifically is evolved, there's a lots of technology solutions that have come together. In my last deck that I've seen, there's some 8,000 odd MarTech companies across the world. So it's obviously a very mixed bunch. The boundaries are diffuse. The handshake points are not very clear. And marketers who've been like amazing marketers for 20 years, who've done a lot of brand building and creative work, are now a little confused because there is marketing and technology and data. And the IT folks are also now you know, a seat at the table and it's important to understand how to break this thing down. So what I would love to do as a simple exercise during the next 45 minutes to one hour that we have here is go down the room understanding uh, how your journey towards retention or user engagement has been, where you are in that process now, a couple of key challenges that you, you know, uh, encountered and how did you solve for them? Because uh, we have tech angle, we have brand angle, we have a founder level perspective on maybe how and why retention has been important to you as a priority. And what would be a great outcome from this exercise is each of you gets with slightly broader perspective on how this and why this and what this, right? So that's really where we are. So while of course it's a large group and I'll still take some time to remember all the names in sequence. So maybe we'll just go quickly around the room as a first round in terms of, you know, quickly one intro, what do you do in the company? And what's your take on uh, where you are in the retention and engagement play? And you know, what's your biggest challenge in learnings? Yeah, should we start with you? Sure. Yeah. Yeah, please. Yeah, please. Check. Hello. 
So I'm founder at Mirror. Uh, we are into cross-border lifestyle e-commerce products. Uh, we've been in business for about 10 years now. Um, for us, on the uh, personalization sort of a journey, I think we have had a hits and misses. Um, so we use bunch of solutions. Um, I think, uh, and this is what I was talking to about a uh, little earlier as well. Uh, so there are various personalization solutions that we use in terms of whether it comes to recommendations, uh, whether it comes to email as a marketing automation solution. And the problem is that a lot of these are data silos and these tools sort of don't talk to each other and that's one of the specific problems that we were actually talking about and if there is a way, I was actually specifically asking for if there is a way to actually solve a lot of these things. So for us, uh, currently uh, being able to really use tools that we have already implemented to its full potential, that's one. And two, making sure that uh, data silos don't exist. Basically, tools talk to each other. That's the uh, couple of problems that we are actually uh, stuck with. So that's where we are most in the, in, in, in the sense of personalization journey where we are. Sure. You ready to do your uh, hi everyone, I'm Sanjay and I had uh, technology for Bestseller. Uh, I would assume that you know Bestseller as an organization, but I mean, just to substantiate, we own uh, some of the apparel brands like Jack and Jones, Veromora only, and I'm selected to name a few. Uh, on the uh, other, I know the journey and the, the challenges towards, you know, how to personalize, right? I think uh, this personalization or hyper personalization is again, you know, is becoming more of a necessity as of now, at least in the segment where we operate. Uh, I think uh, it's very, very difficult to engage a customer if you start throwing him with, uh, you know, a bombing kind of scenario where you show him uh, 50 styles and none of them are relevant to it. And after a while, basically, he gets bored or she gets bored and then you start, stop looking at the messages or, you know, marking with a spam. Right? So the challenge is that, you know, how to send, let's say, Mau, right? uh, uh, offer or a campaign, basically, which is completely different to what is being sent to Sunday. And, and that's where, basically, the importance of data. Uh, and how to make sure that those silos are not there. You get the data from offline, you get the data from online, you get the data from partner. Uh, you get, uh, basically, uh, the the uh, shopping history of the customer, the crawling history of the customer, and then on top of it, basically, uh, you know, not necessary that the black blazer what you have bought two years back, uh, you will buy next. Right? Uh, so then, you know, mix it with the trends. Right? So this, those trend watching, basically, that is again an important thing. All of it, basically, you mix it and curate it, and then, you know, a send the offer. And, and then you should get a wow from the customer. And if you get that wow, then it got, it gets converted into uh, first a view, then into the discovery, and then eventually it results into the purchase. Uh, being tech, I think there is a lot more, a lot of tech play available. Right? Uh, first is the data collection, then you know data cleansing, and then you know you refine the data, you run those engines, and and basis that you know. Uh, you send those campaigns and then provide a beautiful UI to the consumer where you know he can view it and then from there basically he completes the journey. Uh, I will not say that we are at a very advanced stage, uh, but still I think the stage at it is that if you are our customers and I am hoping that you are. Right? Uh, soon you should you should get something you know very very personalized a message coming in your at least the SMS boxes followed by the WhatsApp boxes where. Well, you know, it will take you to uh, a platform where you know, it is a, a very, very personalized uh, curated offering which is going to be, you know, shown to you. And I hope that it should work. So that's where we are in the journey. Challenges, yes. Uh, data silos are different. I mean, still, I think, I mean, a lot of tech development has happened, but then, you know, still you have to figure out uh, uh, something like a ERP, like SAP, right, where you just send and then, you know, do complete transaction end to end. You don't have to worry about it. Uh, unfortunately, uh, you don't have one single system where you say that you know, I feed it and then you know I get output, and then which is uh, completely usable output. So that's where the challenges is. I mean, there are multiple systems; they have to talk to each other, they have to understand each other, and then uh, you integrate them, and then probably you know, uh, send those offers. I mean, that's where we are. Data silo seems to be a consistent trend for Yeah.
Uh, hi, good evening everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Rajgopal Nai. I work as uh, Chief Technology Officer at uh, Metro Brands. Metro Brands is a primarily offline uh, footwear retailer. We operate uh, 700 stores across the country under the brand names of uh, Metro Mochi, Walkway, Crocs, Fit Flop, and uh, now Fila and Proline. Hopefully you are you own one or more pairs uh, of our uh, footwear, especially the ladies. Thank you for being customers. You know, typically for us, uh, for every pair that uh, a gentleman buys, or majority of the time is forced to buy, right? By, by his better half, uh, ladies buy four pairs. So thank you very much for the business. Now, uh, <coughs> being a primarily footwear retailer, and then stepping in, today 90% of our sales still continues to be offline, right? And that whole journey, uh, into the online world itself, uh, you know, is 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 unique because you have a, a fledgling uh, e-commerce team, right? Oh, ha, oh, kuch to kar rahe hai, is what the rest of the company starts thinking, right? Then you have COVID happening, and suddenly <laughs> it is like, hamar le kuch karo, <laughs> right? So for us, uh, during COVID, actually, e-com uh, came to forte because uh, that was the only channel through which we were able to get some material out. All the stores were closed, right? Now, uh, that being said, uh, today we successfully operate uh, four of our own brand sites, right? And uh, a lot of, uh, an equal amount of sale also happens to third party marketplaces. Now, uh, when, when you take a step back, you know, and look at all the digital marketing, etc., you realize that today we have a lot of treasure pro of where things happen in a, in a store. When you walk in into the store, you know, the, the salesperson approaches you, but internally there's an AI working in his head, right? If a lady steps in, is she buying for herself, for a child, or for a, a, some a male, right? Once that happens, what is the color they are tending to? What is the occasion that they are tending to? That is something that can be easily conversed and asked for. When you, but when you do it, uh, when you're working in a nameless, faceless fashion online, is where the challenges start coming up. So for us also, it has been a journey of learning over there. We first you know, had a website, then we started having... Uh, in the, in the product landing page, you start uh, putting alternate uh, uh, rows would be a so-called AI-driven output, and then try and you know use the normal output as a control group to figure out how kind of what kind of progress that happens. Recently, we uh, launched a new format called as uh, BioFoot. Uh, it is primarily uh, tends to the area of orthopedics, right? But with the fashion. Now, the kind of uh, uh, clientele who, who will come there who have people who have a foot problem and a lot of them tend to be, you know, uh, our parents, our uncles, aunties, etc. Now, uh, these ladies and gentlemen will have a very low digital uh, quotient, right? So what happens in that case? You know, you still have to uh, work on age-old uh, proven technologies like word of mouth, WhatsApp, right? Things of that nature. So uh, when, when looking from a, a tech angle, you know, on how to improve in this whole area of you know, online sale or automation, typically the challenges are the standard everywhere. It is PPT, you know, people, process and technology. People being an e-commerce team out there saying, yeah, IT wala ko kuch aata nahi hai. Well, there's a typical thing that happens across the board. Processes being, of course, each one comes in with their way of doing things and their technology stack, right? Uh, like, I again echo the, the silo uh, issue that is there. But more and more one has to realize that as a business, we are more and more getting into not doing things ourselves, but working as an ecosystem play. So the technology team, and especially in the area of integration, is a necessary even that one has to master in order to be successful. Right? One of the big, uh, recent integrations we have done is that we have set up a customer data platform. Now, wherein all our offline sale, we are able to correlate with the online sales, including store footfall, etc., all of that in one place. Now imagine the kind of data that you have. Well, I have a store which has, let's say, 80% uh, male footfall, uh, the balance being uh, ladies coming in, right? Now I can start looking at, in that catchment area, what is the kind of footfall that is happening outside versus who are stepping in, right? We use CCTV analytics for that, right? The other thing is that, is my merchandising aligned with the kind of footfall that is coming in? So the sky is the limit as far as technology is concerned and a few of us are in the right place at the right time. Thank you. Good afternoon everyone. Good afternoon. Myself N.P. Singh. I, am, uh, I handle a brand called Samsonite and uh, there are uh, associated brands as well in my portfolio. 
uh, such as American tourist, chameleon, and uh, also to me comes under uh, our uh, company control. Whereas in India, the distribution distribution of to me is done through the Reliance. Uh, however, the airport retail or international retail, uh, uh, which is governed through the uh, primary body from uh, Hong Kong, is controlled by me. So. Let me give you a quick brief of Samsonite journey. In uh, year 2000, we started the uh, serious uh, retail uh, exploration for Samsonite in India. Without knowing the fate of it, we entered in, frankly speaking, with very less hope that it will succeed. Mainly for the reason that our prices were four times higher than the competition brand. Secondly, the competition was so, so strong that we could not have thought of really creating a, a foothold so easily in the local market. For simple reason that, uh, you know, you enter into the, the platforms available in those days were the dealers, the traditional channel, whereby the strength is measured through how much margin you give, how much credit you give, and uh, how much money you spend on advertising and, and, and few other things which used to interest them. And we were not representing any of them. We were not able to spend much because we were a new brand and we had limited, uh, limited budget for introduction. Our, our discounts were 20% or 20, 23% max, where the competition used to give 38%. We never used to offer any credit and uh, whereas everybody else was offering credit of 60 days to 75 days. Uh, so everywhere else we have been, uh, uh, you know, losing the foothold, uh, whereas the product, we have been having the best product amongst a lot. But what if your, you know, the channel which connects with the customers is not ready to connect you? And very soon we started to get a lot of, uh, you know, uh, adverse uh, reactions, meaning, we dispatched stocks to a particular dealer and the stock comes back after one month stating that we are under pressure to return the stock. What was the pressure? We tried to find out the pressure was that the competition brand has announced in the market that we want to consolidate the market. Like for example, there is a market called Corolla. So there will be a communication from them saying that we want to consolidate. Consolidation meaning we want to have few dealers, a few dealer has to go away. The one who has to go away is the one who has been dealing with Samsonite. So, in those days, 90% market share was controlled by one brand. And we started with that kind of a struggle, just quickly to give you a little background of that. And then we realized that with the same formula, uh, meaning the same rule of the game, we can't win. They're too strong. And therefore, the need for the retail emerged as an only alternate available. And I was the one who never had any experience of retail, had to spare at the whole thing. That's how the journey started with the first store in two, year, year 2001. Today we are about 780 stores. The turnover from 50 crore to today 1800 crore, we've reached this long journey of uh, 21 years. And a lot of experiments we have undergone through. Today we have reached to a state whereby everything is so atomized and auto, auto controlled that we don't have to ask for anything from the operations team, meaning the store staff do not have to order, the warehouse person do not have to ask for the what will be my transfer after three months, or after six months or after nine months. So it, it works centrally, the program is uh, controlled under uh, through the ERP, but it's the same program what we otherwise use in Europe, US and the other part of the world. We have a very, very uh, seamless uh, systems in place, uh, starting with e-commerce, starting with customer engagement program, measuring the uh, replenishment cycle to the customer behavioral changes we capture, because our production is not so, uh, it, it, it needs to be planned something like seven months in advance. We have a very uh, complex production system. So, uh, because we don't depend upon one factory. Like for example, India operation is dependent upon the supplies through 18 factories across the globe. 
and we in turn also export back to you know those countries. So there are a lot of exchange of uh, product lines ha keeps happening. So everything else other than the retail is coming through a different system. The retail and the uh, logistics is controlled through another system, which is again it's global, and uh, uh, it keeps getting modified. Uh, that but that happens after a lot of effort. It, it's not so easy that if I like something and I want to do it, it do not happens. We are not we are not so easily permitted to tweak the program. So we we frankly speaking, we work under very tight box uh, structured system. But somehow it's working well for us. We have been growing year on year, and we have reasonably good good amount of uh, happy customer base. And we are expanding in terms of retail. We are expanding in terms of e-commerce. E-commerce, sorry, we don't want to expand much too much. We don't, we don't want to sell much too much. We rather control uh, because with a lot of hard work, when we built the retail from 50 crore to you know 15, 1800 crore. We don't want to dilute it by virtue of having no experiential sales happening. So here we are the one company, I don't know how many of uh, us will be ready to take this kind of a challenge that e-commerce we respect as a channel because it's, a, it's an alternate which you cannot shut your eyes towards. However, we don't want to shift the customers from the retail experience to the e-commerce. If by virtue of e-commerce we get additional set of customers that is most welcome but not by virtue of creating another alternate for them to buy or 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 by virtue of some discount if he is buying through e-commerce that is not at all you know uh, it's, it is uh, it's not preferred by us in, in any manner so this is how we work and operate and anything more than this we can Sure, I'd love to double click on the relationship that you developed because I'm assuming there's a degree of brand loyalty involved as well. Yeah. But yeah, we can get to that once we go on the road. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Shishir Gupta. Uh, I'm a founder for Kalki Fashion. So we are one of the few brands who have scaled online and offline. Uh, so we are only channel brand. Uh, we do our own designing. Um, so that that is something that distinguishes other e-commerce players. So we are more a D2C player. And we've been online for about 10 years now. And we've been offline for 10 years. So um, for us, I think retention is more about uh, brand advocacy, right? How do you, how does a customer go and refer 10 other customers? So our focus is how we can engage with the customer, uh, get them to spread the word, give them the experience. Uh, and also like our product is more need based. It's an occasion where, so it's, it doesn't depend, like, you know, we cannot, bombard the customer with products and then expect them to buy something, right? So we need to engage with the customer um, and have the brand recall that whenever they have an occasion, they think about our brand first. So uh, that is our pain point, like, you know, how do we create those brand advocates? How do we make it easier for the customer to refer other friends and family uh, and uh, scale, right? And we, d we don't want to look at the customer as a data point, right? Because I think there's so, so much data happening. Uh, we want to be more uh, in touch with the customer. Uh, we don't want to feel make them feel that you know, it's an Excel sheet and we're looking at numbers. So we don't want them to be numbers. So how do we scale in a way that we are able to personalize, know each customer what they want, uh, and uh, have that connect that it's not, you know, uh, that's not a brand which is selling to millions, right? So it should be personalized. They should feel that, you know, uh, uh, this brand cares for us, right? There's empathy. So how do we create that at scale is what uh, we want to work on. Uh, hi, I'm Natasha from Soulfla. So Soulfla is a natural skin and hair care brand. Uh, it's a clean beauty brand. And uh, I think the way we look at e-commerce is that, I mean, for us also, we, we grew in e-commerce during Corona actually. Uh, before that, we were at shoppers and a lot of retail places. We sell at a lot of chemists, like uh, Asian chemists and wellness and reliance and stuff like that. So the whole idea, I think, uh, for me, uh, I like I was speaking before, I used to actually make the products when we started. Of course. 
we are a very small company as compared to all of you all and uh, but we do we have been in the market for 20 years so we have a lot of data we have a lot of customers uh, our retain uh, our returning customer is 60 percent 60 percent people come back it's a little bit more than 60 but 68 actually so the whole idea for us is uh, I uh, so I, I kind of uh, designed the whole journey right from the product, the packaging, uh, what we speak to the customer, when they must use the pro product, how the product is made. So I think uh, what I think is e-commerce needs to be used. What is it that they cannot see when they come into your store? So for example, uh, if you come to my social media, you'll see my office and you'll see I have 17 cats in the office and 12 dogs. So you'll see the cats and dogs in the office and people are working. And people love it. They actually love it. Whenever we've done any animal related post, it's got 15x more uh, views and likes. Or uh, maybe me talking about the product, how did I think about a product, they love that kind of stuff. Or what's happening at the farm, because we have a farm in Rajasthan where we make the products. So the people who make the products. So yes, I have kind of, uh, you know, last week, I think two weeks ago, they said, Kalki said, uh, sent out an uh, email with a yellow image. And all the models are sitting there and I said, this is fantastic. And I, I must show you this image. So I made my gown ka adiwasi sit like that. <laughs> I made them with the saris and I copied the same kalki pose and it looks so amazing. So what I'm, what I'm just trying to tell you is that I'm using e-commerce to show the customer what they can't see when they walk into a shop, a stop or a reliance. That we are using it for. And um, the old customers relate more and they build a rapport. So for example, I have never seen what a metro shoe factory looks like. Okay, I don't know the people who work there. But I wish I could, right? Okay, you, you get what I'm trying to say. So now this happens now, it's because of we are clean beauty, people are very interested to know how it's manufactured because that uh, influences their decision to buy the product. So the difference is that we say that, look, this is so easy, this is preservative free, this is natural. They go, Gajar ja raha hai, whatever that makes them buy the product. The whole uniqueness that it is not made in a factory. So I think that is uh, what they, what I use e-commerce for. The second thing is uh, I am a little different in thinking that I don't want the person to from the store to come to me. If I talk about myself, I have not gone to a store in three years. I have bought his suitcase from Amazon. <laughs> And I was like, shit, Amazon was so big, but it was very small. This is something I felt. I said, it's so small. So, yeah, and, and I think uh, what happens is, so now I'll tell you when I buy, I'm a, I'm, I'm a customer of all of you all. So when I buy your product, my problem is not just you, any fabric. It looks different when I see it on Mintra and when I see it, oh my God, it's so transparent, I can't wear it. Things like that. So always go down and I scroll and see the pictures of the customers. So customer experience. So I think what, what, what I wanted to say is that if you're if we were talking about silos and data and things like that, my main job is to sit with all the tech people and bring the human part in it. Because they'll tell me, you know, you aapka ma'am, aapka ye hai, 1.43, whatever, you know, conversion rate. I don't even remember the words. I said, but who is the customer? So I, I think, go and read the comments. The customer has added your ad, whatever. What are the comments they are talking? What is the DMs that they are giving you on Instagram? Is so important. You should be where your customer is. And you should be thinking like him. So for example, I am just telling you, when I buy clothes? When? After 12 o'clock at night. I go on the Zara site. So my friend sits on, my neighbor sits on Zomato. This is what she does, she loves noodles. She sits on Zomato and she sees food. And I'm on Zara site seeing Zara ke kapde ne podem kaatne ko to sleep. But this is where I buy it. So I'm just saying, this is, this is what I think most women who buy can guarantee tell you clothes, this is how we buy it. Now it just discovered urbanic, you know. And I've been doing that. <laughs> but uh, my point is that understand what the customer is. The customer is not a number. The, the issue I think that you all have is that you all have got too many customers. Like the, the problem of plenty pro possibly, obviously I can't expect that you should be sitting and seeing the DMs and things like that. But let me tell you, if you actually do it, you understand so much. So for the last two months now, we've started, I've started doing a lot of road shows. So I was in the Bridal Asia and I was in the Little Flea. 
and you will be surprised. Uh, uh, there is another uh, funny thing that came out. I have so many customers who came and told me, oh yes, we have seen you at Shoppers. But nobody said, I saw you on Amazon. Nobody said, I saw you on Mintra. Nobody said, I saw your ad in Instagram. So people don't remember uh, online stuff. This is what I kind of figured. Ke ya the kind of ads we are running are not memorable. Because they but they don't remember you offline. So this is something that I think I want to work on. This is a, a very important thing. The other thing I feel is that wherever the customer wants to be and however he wants to buy, I need to be there. This is important. He can't walk to my store, I don't mind it. I will send him the product. Like you said, the person you call and they come, oh, oh, Nagesh uh, spoke about that, right? You call your chemist. I have never been to Asian chemist in my life, but I call him every day. <laughs> I call him at 11 in the night and my product med medicine comes. So I think this is what we need to understand, that you've got to be there for the customer. But uh, the main thing is that their customer is not a number. It's like, uh, I'd just like to end to say, is like having an Indian shadi. Shadi mein, you have the dula walas have to be treated differently. The elders have a different thing. The kids have an after party, right? Unka alag hota. Everybody has a alag kind of thing, but they all coming to a wedding. So it's the same thing. So if he has his, uh, you know, his clothes, there is somebody who wants to buy it for a function. There's somebody like me who's just browsing a yaad this sarvakam. He says, nice to let me buy it. He, you need to understand that the same customer is also buying different things online and offline. This is another thing that I have understood that when customer comes to my store, I sell a lot of aroma, but I don't manage to do that online because it's not expect. You know, they can't experience it. So I think these are a few things that at least I work on. Very fascinating. So you know, boutique brands, I'm pretty sure, will you know become mainstream. And the challenge for you would be when you cross over to a slightly larger scale, how do you control that experience as tightly? Maybe you choose to not scale beyond a point because you would rather retain no, no, that experience. Yeah, well, then I would be very curious to understand, you know, how do you switch over from the level of tight personalized control on, you know, the way you're doing it? Because at some point, the segments will be multiple, the customer yeah, ties will be multiple. Like your yeah, so no, I'm not making my sales pitch here, but, you know, that's where, uh, you know, all the other gentlemen have shared their challenges on data silos because at scale, it just doesn't become easy. Right? And you mentioned about personalizing the experience across the board, and it's, it's not easy because there's too much to deal with. But go on, please. Hi, good evening. Uh, my name is Sandeep and I did the IT and digital for the bank loan. Uh, just to share that bank loan has completed 25 years of a relation with the romancing within customer. Uh, so, uh, this is a brand where I've been working with this for the last <coughs> 10 years now after acquisition from MG. And many times people say that why you are stuck with this from so many years, being in tech, in a mark company, so I many times share them, say, somehow I've fallen in love with this brand. So, as a worker, not as a consumer. But that, that that's also a problem. Like, yeah. So, uh, on, uh, on a few, what are the, what we do and what are the challenges, I think, uh, nothing to add than what uh, my friends have shared. And we are in the same boat. Sure. Similar business, probably our stores are Larger SQs are much more. We have to build with uh, 16 million loyalty member customer. Two, we get uh, approximately 30,000 customer feedback on on the bill every day. So how? 30,000 consumer feedback on a bill every day. On a bill. On a bill. On a bill. So, so we. Instead of paper bill, we give a digital bill, and we so on an NPS, so on an NPS and the L1, L2 score, so we get around thirty thousand feedback every day. So uh, now it's a huge feedback for. And thank you, Natasha, for having a lot of insights uh, on this. Uh, so one is uh, how to go through that feedback, and getting out the real insight. And many times, uh, what I heard is. If you have a lot of data, okay, we, the insight, I'm saying, insight or whatever output we generate is very generic and not what you talked about, saying that Dula ka need hai to, uh, bacho ka need hai to, the youngster need is 
So this is what is a bigger challenge, I, I see. Two, I think we have been on a personalization journey for a long time and many times we have gone back and talked about probably we were the first or the first few to generate a single view of a consumer to have 180, 200 characteristic of individual customer what we have generated but that is how I am able to convert that into the purchase and making sure that what personalization message I give the customer is able to buy like for example if I have a huge data I churn and say if I, for example I want to now I can't send more than 10 items to a consumer see look at that 5 10 is, is good enough out of 5 10 what should be a ratio of what she has been buying regularly what should be a what should be a new styles what we want her to try to what is missing on her, on her basket and we want them to add because we are a family store so we, we want to sell so many things and then what should I come back and say the baggage will come and say that probably this is the one you should push it to the say, market to consumer because they are not buying a bag so how to balance that two if I send something to a consumer and tell them saying and many of our customers are not comfortable buying on that some of the large part of it before covid was not comfortable now if i give them a personalized message and tell them to go to a store will i have a stock of that in the store that's a bigger challenge even in an online sense what happens is if i send it and consumer want to buy through a store that time that stock is not available though in system it shows the stock but that I can't find it that happens in Pesar okay yeah. so Mitra all that banner in her ruby dresses and yeah. go inside to yeah. buy for hair you don't know this is no. special <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> so you don't want to get the so on the store when you come so when I get an order I'm just sharing a challenge of the the huge size of the store so volume 2 I go to you got an order and I want to keep minimize minimum inventory in the store because I want to pack it in a warehouse where I should be able to replenish much faster. Now in the store if I keep two piece or three piece of each garment which is good enough for each size and that itself would be few lakh SKUs individually. Now out of that one is is customer is is already in the queue. Okay, bought it, not built, so inventory is not updated. Two, one customer has already carrying, okay. And third is already somebody has tried and thrown. I don't know in which part of the <laughs> Okay, so store has an order. System is showing stock of three. I'm not able to find a single piece. And then the store is three floor. So these are, the, these are the challenge of though you turn a data, you generate some beautiful, nice looking personalized message which is bang on consumer. Consumer has walked it into a store but you are not able to do it. Two, in, an, uh, in uh, post COVID the, another thing changed is that because we were, though we had an online site and we were selling good uh, post covid like everyone we had to move to and online and, and the whole journey has changed for all of us and now what we are focusing on is we should give a best customer service in the store and like some of the global brand where there is no one to help you unless you ask for here i'm saying from greeting them to uh, making sure that you have a help available now our journey start from discovery so earlier discovery starts in the store. It used to start from a store and in a very controlled environment. Now making sure that you are present in a discovery too and you are hand holding and consumer right up top. This is not our own challenge, it's a challenge for everyone. And then creating those journeys and then making sure that you have uh, the tech available, the data available, you are checking your data and you have uh, the product available to support them. Different challenges here. Yeah. Uh, and then even I'm saying, and then adding to what I'm saying, 
huge data integration, making sure that... 16 million or low, I think. Yeah, yeah. That's insane amount of data. Yeah. For sure, that's probably get to bag it and have some window open. Hi, uh, I'm Mahua, Mahua Chaturvedi, and I uh, head the Bagit business. Uh, that's Pratya, she's my CHRO, she's joined us. Yeah. Okay. yeah, Nina was there, and I, yes. Uh, so it's a self-funded business, and I can't tell you the importance I heard. I heard Soul Flower, and I heard, I mean, I've, I've met the bestseller, IT head, and other forums, and you know, nice to meet all of you. Um, you in a self-funded business, you can't run the business without data because efficiencies are extremely, extremely, extremely important. We cannot have wastage. We need to have absolutely correct stock covers. We need to have the right inventory. We need to sell it at a particular velocity and you know, all of that. So data runs, data is the lifeblood of the company. And that doesn't mean that you know, we are losing focus from the customer. Right, because data is actually, and I was hearing all of, uh, and I think uh, that's the opportunity for any Martech platform or whatever you call it, whatever name you uh, give it, to come in and help people who think data actually takes you away from the consumer. Because everywhere I heard that the data is taking us away from the consumer, and I'm keeping an eye on the consumer and not on the data. The data actually helps you understand the consumer, right? So, so just getting into a little bit of details. Uh, I am a strong, strong, strong believer in CDP. I think businesses cannot run without a CDP platform. Um, uh, the first time I used a CDP, you know, I moved, I was a marketing head there, now I head the business. I started becoming a business generator when I started using CDP, because otherwise I was always a spender. So the, CD, <laughs> so the CDP helps you identify what's the right attribution to sales. So it tells you. So so today you've given a discount on your on your channel, and you know the sale has gone up. And you know, and your CEO that I was a marketing head, and your CEO would tell you, hey, they got discount. The other sale, I you know, and you would feel oh, all the things I've done on Instagram, like you said, you know, I put a lovely picture, and that didn't help. And I give a ten percent discount, and that's a generated business. What CDP does, <coughs> no, no, just as is helps you track that that consumer came in five months back when you put up that yellow picture, came and saw that product. She came back three times again and she waited for that 10% when that message went and she converted. So will you give the credit to that 10%? Will you give the credit to that yellow? No, you will know that which is the right mix. The yellow picture is the right mix plus the 10% discount is the right mix and some of the other things you did is the right mix to finally make a convert, right? So CDP is actually the holy grail of this entire uh, business. Having said that, the challenge that we have and also the, the solution that I'm looking at is a you know, uh, large part of our like you know, of, of these businesses like a Samsonite or like Metro or like Baguette is offline. Right? And CDP and all of that is so much more online. And um, so many customers come to my stores and so many, and I'm not being able to capture the data unless they are buying, and which becomes a part of my CRM. Right? But today when I start investing in Omnichannel and when I start investing in NSIL, then I'm being able to capture the data better. And when I start able, and when I'm able to capture the data better, say, okay, you came into my store and you because it's very difficult to add, otherwise, uh, you know, lock in the data into the same CDP platform if you're just coming into my store and not purchasing. But if you're part, if you have the endless aisle, if somebody's checking your products, even if they're not purchasing, you immediately are able to capture the data and you know that yes, okay, she came in, she saw something here, she later converted into a, in another store with you know, the same bag. So that's the second aspect you know, of, of data management and offline and online integration that we're looking at in Bagit and in other places. The third uh, and the most important part, which I think everybody was talking about, is that any business, especially fashion business, and most of us over here are in fashion business. I'm not Samsonite, I'm not Lawrence and Mayo, but most of us. Lawrence and Mayo? Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yes. I, I, yes, okay, yes. But I'm saying um, is there is an art and science of the business, right? The science of the business is about the numbers. The art of the business is 
you know, is what your heart falls in love with. Yeah, it's, you know, you just can't predict. You can't predict a Hollywood blockbuster. You can't predict a Bollywood blockbuster. Similarly, you cannot predict which is the product your consumer is going to fall in love with, and all your metrics is going to dissolve over there, and which is the product that the consumer is not going to like, and all your metrics are going to dissolve over there. And this is where I think the big gap is, and this is where everybody is talking about what the consumers will love, we can't predict. But if there was a better way, whether it's going to be the chat GPTs of the world, which is the next AI module, which is better way of understanding trends and dovetailing that into consumer insights and helping use that to forecast your product mix and your style mix, then you would get a far much higher success rate of your inventory. If we can move towards that, and in Bagit, once I d start tried doing it very manually, I looked at all info. So I, I thought, sat back and thought, hey, what did uh, large fashion brands do earlier? Large, I mean, I was in Aditya Birla and we used to go to the premium of Amazon, we used to go to the text world, and we used to go to all of these places to understand what's the trend. Of course, COVID happened, we stopped going all of that. But today the trends are being done by Instagram influencers, etc. So I did a manual exercise of trying to understand what are the influencers talking about as trends and can I draw from there and, and, and segment and, and, and see what are the different kinds of segments of consumers coming from there and what's the good of the new trend, can I forecast. I also looked at various other trend forecasting tools in terms of these soft forecasts. And uh, I have not yet been able to get a great answer which helps integrate. Yeah. What's my big challenge today? My big challenge today is exactly this. That uh, my forecasting should be so good that my sale, and like you said, uh, even back it doesn't sell at any discount. My sale at 0% discount has, an, has a velocity which is very high and we should have an SDR of 90%. Right? That's my... That's the crux of my business. That's the crux of my working capital management, right? Because we're a self-funded company. If I can get into a forecasting method, which doesn't just look at my, of course, I have a great forecasting method. I have an ARS tool which looks at my own sale, and looks at you know what should we should produce, but that's really half of it. What is going to succeed tomorrow if if AIs of the world can learn from the trends? and give me some indication over there where I can understand what products to make, which was going to give me a STR at 0% discount of 90% or 80%, then I have cracked my business even better. Yeah. So I think that's uh, the most important thing right now. It's really a very a large opportunity to crack, but it's almost like a magic wand uh, if yeah. one were to have it, right? And everybody would be happy to put dollars on the table to buy a tech like that, for sure. Good evening, colleagues. Uh, Dr. Ben Nonsa from Retail Association, uh, sorry, Lawrence Sermeo, part of Retail Association for, uh, I think, the seventh member of Retail Association of India in the long years of history. Uh, the topic was basically personalization, so I'm just going to really not come to tech a little later, but we start we basically with the personalization of the product. So a progressive lens which is worn for people above the age of 40 to a male uh, client is totally different from uh, say a housewife who is also above the age of 40. So personalization of product, in fact uh, India invented a progressive lens for the country. Uh, if you see sight vision in uh, China or the eastern uh, part of the world, they've got much smaller eyes. So we have got a progressive lens, so we start with personalization of the product. Secondly, uh, when talking, uh, we've even uh, recently a client just Twitter picture and send me on WhatsApp of our spectacle cases. We are so proud of our spectacle cases. We have gone a step further is when our customers lose too many of the spectacle, uh, le uh, uh, spectacle cases and their frames. They would, we would be happy but we have actually personalized by putting their names on it and their mobile numbers. So if they leave it in the airline pocket, it's returned and they really thank us for it. Uh, we don't maul our customers. So there are a lot of brands which are mauling their customers over emailing, over calling, over whatsapping and I think the, the brands are losing their dignity. So we, we don't over ring up our, our clients. We are sitting on 2.5 million database. 2% of, of India's richest and wealthiest people are our clients. So we are not a discount brand. We are established in 1877, 146 years. 
I, th I think there are very few brands can, can talk about the Queen of England, uh, 1923 being our client, Mahatma Gandhi, Pandit Nehru, Rabindranath Tagore, Jayadi Tata, Jiri Bilda, Narayan Murthy, Sudha Murthy, uh, Kiran Mazumdar Shaw, Azim Premji, and the list goes on. So we don't compete with people who either sell uh, you know, by weight or by uh, things like that. So uh, please don't compare my brand or, uh, with any other brand. <laughs> We are a fashion brand, thank you ma'am. Ma'am is my client. We have been on e-commerce e since uh, 2010. Our customers still prefer to walk into our stores. So we have 100, and, uh, 100 stores plus. We have five boutiques. So let me make you sit up. The products in our boutiques start from uh, right from 35,000 to going up to 35 lakhs. And uh, they, uh, to be a little boastful, I should be, that some of our boutiques are even better looking than the Tanish showrooms. They have elevators and works in it, and in everyone in white gloves. So we've been on e-commerce for the last 12 years. Uh, it is basically understanding if a client wants to be emailed, WhatsApp, physical meeting. We send out a notification to approximately 40,000 of our clients, ask them, do you want us to occupy your, uh, some wall space in your house or office. Do you know how many people responded? 10,000 of our clients responded saying that they wanted our wall calendar. So we were quite shocked. We said, you know, people don't want to touch paper after COVID, people are allergic, people stop subscription to newspapers. 10,000 of our clients responded and we couriered 10,000 clients. Still today, I'm getting requests. We are on the 22nd of February that I have not decided to send me another courier. I gave you the, my wrong address, now I shifted to Gurgaon. So that is the value. So don't presume that everyone in detail, you know, wants everything in tech space. There are people who still prefer to walk in the store. Yes, they appreciate. We have been computing since 1988. The first set of computers, I am from the family business. I am the third generation. Fourth generation has already joined two youngsters. And we have a whole team. Now I want to shake you all up a little bit and tell you that all of us are very complacent in the retail industry and in Europe and in America. And I am going to really give you value when you leave uh, today uh, this beautiful venue and go back home. I am the only person and I can claim in India on 31st December, I don't know what you all are doing, it's none of my business, but I am wait waiting for Pantone to announce the color of the year. And Pantone has announced the color of the year as Viva Magenta. And I have gone through at least 26 websites in India and ordered from Paris a suit color which is called Viva Magenta. So none of the brands produce, I think the closest to this is so Viva Magenta is to what this gentleman is wearing. And, <laughs> and, and why are not brands, why are not brands when a global company announces the color of the year, what the F are we doing if we don't produce products and merchandise? We all do. Uh, <laughs> we, <laughs> that's, that's right, I'm happy to know that. Yeah. So, a blue color, what I'm wearing was supposed to be dead stock in Lawrence and Mio 18 years ago. With every, India runs on something what... Uh, Mr. Amit Sada taught me and Dr. Srini taught me, India runs on ABCD, Astrology, Bollywood, Cricket and Movies, or oh, Politics if you say, or oh, Religion. So if you, if a Hollywood movie comes out 18 years ago, I would have had to sell this as 70% discount. Today the blue color is the trendiest color. So as you said ma'am, rightly, you don't know where the consumers are going to change. All your forecasting goes into the dustbin. Right. It is only going back to conventions, watching people, listening and talking to people, do you get really insights. Okay, so Pantone color is your color of the uh, message to take back, start producing products, which it and people will lap it up. Because people want a reason to change to something fashionable. And if you give them that, they can do it. Thank you, Jayan. I just want to add to what he said. You know, I, I, I'm a, I was just telling him, I'm a very big, f actually a fan of Lawrence and Mayo. And retention is the word here. So I have had, uh, you know, and the reason I didn't say that he was a, you know, it, it's a fashion brand is because I'm a user of their uh, contact lens. You know, I had very bad eyes from a kid. But you know, the, my my relationship with Lawrence and Mayo is this: they have my data so from the age of, and I won't tell you my current age, and there's no <laughs> points for guessing. But from the age of 12 to now, they have my data, and they can tell me. Nay, nay, you have not checked your eyes in this year and you must check it and your eye power moved from here to here in, th in 10 years back and this should be your contact lens ma'am and I trust them with my 
to everything. I mean, now with my eyes folded. I don't go to any doctor. I just go to a Lawrence and Mayo clinic, and they give me my best contact lens. So great customer attention in play, right? But uh, I'm, I'm assuming this is on the back of a lot of systems, right? Because there's no way you're able to track those 2.5 million customers at that level of granularity. Do you want to spend maybe a little time as to how do you consolidate the data silos? So in your case? Uh, we we bought a lot of products, uh, SaaS models. We have now written our own code. We have our tech team, Mr. Hyderabad. We are 870 uh, team members, and uh, our attrition rate again that's a breaking in the industry is less than 0.25. Right, so we are, there's a case uh, study written about Lawrence Smith's retention history uh, there by independent people. So we have finally, after buying a lot of uh, software products, we've uh, written our own software products uh, because uh, it was <laughs> it was very difficult. I can just tell you uh, that right now there's a no 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 no. no, no yeah, yeah. There's a fight in the organization. Sorry to share this publicly. Part of our, my finance team has gone and got a high end, some Oracle or SAP or something. And second part of the team, so we have a very big engineering business. Every time you use the Bandra Holy C link, Lawrence and your links division provides the uh, global positioning coordinates for that. So the engineering team has gone for Tally Prime. And Tally Prime guys are gloating that their software is much faster than the Oracle and the SAP or whatever software I don't want to uh, specify which one. And the licensing costs. So we have to be real, real you know, I'm part of so many of those WhatsApp and committee groups and all. It's finally the end user or the customer who makes the decision most. I can stand out of XYZ showroom and pull the customer and say, come to my brand. I say, well, I'm going to do what I want. And I will, it's my hard earned money and I'll go where I want to. So offers and gimmicks and people who, people who go for discounts, sorry, they are not loyal to anybody. The next brand which gives them the next high discount, 10 becomes 12, 12 becomes 70, 70 becomes 75, 80% discount. I hear sometimes the brands 80%. How are you making money, boss? Well, they are faithful. They are faithful to the options at any point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To the, uh, to the maximum discount. Yes, I got that. So what's, what's very interesting is the point he made around build versus buy, they made a choice to build. But I wonder if that's a practical option for a large number of people. I mean, I mean it doesn't uh, you know, become a standard choice easily simply because there's too many things that are happening. And I'm very impressed if you're able to maintain that level of granularity and experience. And it's also sort of counter trend because you're able to maintain the no discount policy. And I saw multiple people really taking that stand that I'd rather build my brand. You guys should actually be speakers in the D2C place because uh, we see a lot of brands. We work with more than 100 of them. And it's always in everybody's question that I have to build a brand, but if I drop my discounts, I reduce my discounts, and my sales reduces. And I'm on a quarter to quarter treadmill pale, pale where uh, I need to show growth. And unless I keep discounting, it doesn't work. And nobody has the kind of patience and the runway and the visibility to keep doing it without offering the discounts. So very interesting to learn all of these practices. And I hear the build was your solution, but I'd love to understand if uh, the other solutions that we've seen, I think we've heard a bunch of topics on the data silos. We did hear about the fact that at some point of scale, the whole personal attention will have to switch to data driven plays. And you know, uh, while I might be biased in my view here, but the fact is the Amazons and the Googles and the uh, Facebooks and the Netflixes uh, have kind of proven that whatever you do after a point, data is going to decide who's going to click on what and who's going to buy what. So maybe in your case, while you're choosing that Pantone shade, you're probably in a lot of situations in the position to influence customer choices. So that this is what's in sync. That's probably what you're doing in those sub super new ads as well, right? You're influencing my preferences. But given the way the markets have scaled, the audience is fragmented, what's the one size fits all message? The way a, pan, you know, a parachute brand was built 25 years ago is probably now not how a brand will get built today. Because the consumers are not as homogeneous. There are diverse needs and messages. And hence, the need to personalize becomes that much more important. And that's where, uh, you know, while we are kind of at the end of our slot, and uh, I'm glad at least you could go around the room once, but maybe if there are any, uh, let's say, solutions that anybody has found and that you want to add it as a closing remark, please, uh, this is the opportunity. I, I heard some very, very interesting points from your perspective. So if you want to delve deeper on it. Question about build versus buy, is that no, one of your questions? Question. Okay, so um, see data is the way forward. You, you can't go away from data if you're scaling the business. Yeah. Um, the good part of it is, you know, and I don't know about web engage, but the good part of it is that the startup ecosystems also created a lot of uh, you know a lot of data platforms which are much cheaper. Which are not, you know. So we interacted a lot with Salesforce. Uh, uh, no, 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 no offense to anyone. 
uh, I'm sorry for taking names, but a lot of the big biggies and you know humongous costs of uh, of implementation, all of that. Uh, but there are equal number of startups which have come up come up today, which are you know which also create CDP platforms, which also they built it custom for you. I have used some of them earlier, and I think they work phenomenally. They also come and actually help you. See, the other part of it is, I think somebody mentioned, you mentioned that you've got so much, so much database, right? You have 15, uh, 16 million. Uh, we are much lower, but uh, you know, we also have a large database in Bagot. Uh, so, uh, building the platform is only one aspect of it. A and, and honestly, the marketing head or the business head is not sitting and looking at insights. There is an, uh, there is an uh, team of people who are sitting and looking at insights and they can't make head and tail of the data, right? What these startups help you do, and you know, for you people like you, is they'll come, they'll actually help, you know, present to you on a week-to-week -week basis the insights and way forward. And that makes your D2C journey better, right? And I would recommend that the best way to go is instead of the large big daddies, there are these small startups who are also creating the CDPs. They help you with insights, and they start you on this journey. Yeah. Thanks for that word of confidence. I'd like to believe we're still classified among the startup ecosystem. Uh, <laughs> So yes, we do solve for uh, some of these topics and in, in, in the simple point you mentioned uh, the fact that a lot of this is still new, uh, the adoption of this technology, whether it's a Salesforce, Adobe or that league and something from uh, our offering side as well, a big part of the challenge ends up being the adoption. Because while you will have the new shiny fancy tool, your, if your team doesn't exactly know how to squeeze the most juice out of it, that sometimes becomes a bottleneck as well. Because you know, you're not going to spend personal time on either learning or educating, you need people to be enabled. So in fact, for us, it's become pretty much a mission in itself because our brand slogan itself is Retention Simplified. And that's the title of the session as well. So we believe very, very aggressively in education because that's the only way to make the impact real on the businesses. On that note, if there are no more comments to be made, please. Um, actually, the point that I was trying to make is that uh, the data that we have the communication that we do to the customer has to be more personalized. This is this is the thing that I want to talk about. It's not about not using data and stuff. Data is most important, but it should not be that one communication goes out to all. And I just want to leave you all with this website called Chewy. It's a US-based website. It sells pet uh, supplies and food. I found it about eight years ago or six years ago. And uh, I was looking for a particular special food for my cat that had a thyroid problem. And uh, they, I found it and I ordered it online and they don't deliver to India. So I mean, I got it from somewhere and things like that. You had to put in your pet name and they know his name is Coffee. And I, whenever I have gone back and I've ordered from them, every time I get a mail from somebody that has a name and it says, dear, you know, mom of Coffee and things like that. How's Coffee doing? I hope he's okay and things like that. And then there's a person who, Erika or whatever, there's not just, you know, no one. And it's happened in so many times where I've actually given the wrong address. I gave the address of somebody else and they ship the food. And it's a lot of food, okay? It's like $100, $200, $500 I spent. And then I wrote to them, I've given you the wrong address. Can you cancel the order? They said, it's okay. You keep it and you please give it away to the strays around there. I have never seen a brand doing that. The second time it's happened is I've called, every time I go to US I get something, right? So I've called it to Las Vegas, I've called it to here and there. And they are, they respond so fast. Now if you tell me that Chewy is not a big company, please check it. It was, uh, it was taken over by Walmart and now it's one of the top uh, brands. It's got, I'm sure it, I don't know what is the business they're doing, but it's much more than anyone. And, and pet food is such a big thing, right? How do they personalize it? This is my question. Every time you send them an email, within five minutes you get an email. Even my company doesn't do that. I mean, they're perfect. So I think this is my example for big companies who want to actually personalize it. Please go and see Chewy and you'll understand. And they are, they're connected with the emotions, you see. So they connect the parent with the animal and the emotion. So all I want to say is that I think all our brands, all of us, whatever we are selling, you have to connect with the emotions of the person who's buying the product. Don't sell to the product person. You don't need to sell them online. I still, even I still go to a Zara store. I just look at it and I just scan it and then I order it. <laughs> I do that, but it doesn't matter to you, right? So what I'm trying to say is connect to the emotion, talk to them, tell them about what's happening, educate them. Like he told us about Pantone, right? 
I would like to get an uh, email from bestseller telling me what's the fashion trends. I would love that. Something like that, you know. So this is what I wanted to say. Sure, absolutely. You know, in fact, uh, another problem the worthwhile conversation to have is the line you draw between me getting personalized versus getting a little creepy. And that's a frequent debate I end up noticing. People want to be sensitive about it, but you know, in, in our defense, and our, I mean, it's obviously in sync with our businesses as well. We're very big believers in Netflix when they will put the right kind of recommendation at the top. How much of a creepy that is, that's what drives Netflix. And you're ultimately in a world where the consumer is bombarded with a variety of diverse messages. If you're not the most relevant message he's getting, he is not going to engage with you. Because at scale, that's the noisy world we're operating in, right? So. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here. It's been a great conversation, great learning for me. Hopefully, this was some takeaways. Thank you for you uh, for your inputs as well on that one. We'll see you around. I'm around for the rest of the evening. There's a panel that probably I'll be participating on. But yeah, I would be happy to catch up with all of you on the road. Thank you. Uh, hi. Uh, so, Anku, sir, uh, I will request you to hand over the mementos to our honorable speakers. Thank you so much. Vivek, Vivek Mendonca, sir, will be sharing all the photographs with you. Uh, San Sanjay Kumar Tripathi, sir. Sandeep Mistri, sir. Raj Gopal Naik, sir. Thank you very much for your valuable time. Thank you very, very much.